is a, a lifelong, fruitless pursuit. Don't fix it. You're damaged? Good. Join the club. If you weren't damaged, you don't belong here. <laughs> Go find some yeshiva for tzaddikim or something. Right? Can't help you. If you're damaged, good. I can talk to you. So, you have to take care of those problems. But a Rosh Yeshiva, a Magad Shia, a Rebbe and a Yeshiva, we have to talk our language. There's that book called Whatever Became of Sin. Are you familiar with this? I never remember the guy's name. He started it. He was one of the early psycholo popular psychologists. And he started this clinic in... Uh, I forgot his name. He was very famous in, in back in the 40s. And he wrote a book called Whatever Became of Sin. In the Hagdama, he writes like this. <clears throat> he was invited to speak to a group of young priests about psychology. Huh? Huh? Anyway, um, in Kansas, they have a famous clinic in Kansas. So he was, he was a brilliant psychologist, and he went and he spoke to them and he explained what psychology is. And afterwards, some of these young priests came over to him and said, that was fascinating. Where can we learn more? And he got very upset with them. He said, you want to learn more psychology? I spend my life trying to fix the damage that comes because you don't do your job. You want to do my job? You do your job and I won't be so busy. Whatever became of sin? And he goes through a whole list. We knew that certain things were sins. Then they became crimes. Then they became antisocial behavior. Then they became acting out emotionally. Then they became rage and frustration. And now they're an alternative, life, an alternative lifestyle. <laughs> you know, whatever happened to good old sin? This is allowed and this is not allowed. Shame on you. If we would teach that, there'd be less for psychologists to fix. So, we've all become amateur psychologists. And it's not, it's not working. We're not teaching them to them. We're not good psychologists. In the same line of Sermi Vavasitov, when he, uh, someone who teaches women a lot, uh, there's a huge hysteris about Sneas, and down to the details and millimeters and materials of women's clothing. And I see my own daughters from a young age, they get lambasted with it to the extent that a girl feels, I think, that she's, when she walks in the street, she's just causing everybody to do averas, and, and she's uh, like a heft of iser. <laughs> Very high self image. <laughs> <laughs> She feels powerful. <laughs> she put a filter on her. That's huh? it. With Weinberg said she put a filter on all the women, internet filter. Muslim women are much more modest, right? Outside. Externally. Let's define things. Just, just, I don't know if I'm answering your, your question. But <coughs> Muslim women do not dress things. There is nothing sneezdic about their dress. And, and unfortunately, in some circles in, in, in Jewish communities, we're, we're, we're getting into the same... Taito wants sneeze. Sneeze means, look like a beautiful woman, sanua. Muslims don't like women. Women are a problem. So women in a Muslim society have to dress in such a way that they are not sanua, they're invisible. So to a Muslim, a woman who is dressed sneers is a problem, because she's a woman. When did we develop this problem? When do we have such little respect for women that their very existence offends us or disturbs us? A 
woman should be beautiful, she should look like a woman, you should immediately know that she is a woman, and you should immediately notice that she's Tsunua. But to dress in such a way, there's no woman. There's no women. They, are, they don't exist. That's Tznias? That's that. I don't know what that is. It's certainly not Jewish. So when people say, you know, the Muslim dress even more Tznias, you don't know what Tznias means. Tznias doesn't mean disappearing. It means the beauty you have is is treated appropriately, is handled properly. It's tsunua. This is personal, this is private, this is... But women shouldn't exist. Uh, this is assimilated thinking. We're mimicking them. This is not good. And I think that our, our daughters sense this a little bit and they, and they resent it. I'm a problem? That's what you're telling me? I'm a problem? The world would be better off if I disappeared? That's the message they're getting. And they, they obviously they don't like it. So if you don't tell your daughters that they're beautiful, that they look good, that their hair is done wonderfully, you're, you're, you're not helping. Taita doesn't hesitate to say that the holiest women in the world were beautiful. Beauty is not a problem. Be beauty is beautiful. Jewish girls have to be beautiful. If you can afford it. On the Yosem, and that was they can't afford it, so they don't look so good. But So we have to present Sneas as, as Sneas, not as a problem with women. I was asked to speak about Sneas once to, uh, to the women who are very offended by the whole idea. I know they didn't want to hear about it. They hear about it all the time. It's coming out of their ears. They resent it. They hate it. So instead, it's a modern Rashi that Avram Fried sings about. By Matan Torah, the Ebeshter said that he will speak to Moshe Rabbeinu, and the Eden will hear, the Gam Becho Yaminu Lo'ilam. Moshe tells the Eden, and the Eden say, Ein Edeime. Let's say, Neinu Lirei Ses Malkinu. Moshe Rabbeinu goes back to the Ebeshta and says, the Yidden said that it's a Neinu Lirei says Malkin. The Ebeshta says, that's wonderful. Mi Yitain Vahoyo Levovam Zelehem Kolei. Beautiful. But no. Just listen. <laughs> and then Moshe Rabbeinu reminds them afterwards, remember when you stood by Harsinai the Kol Vilei Isem Kol Tmuna. But is that inspiring? Remember that you didn't see anything. <laughs> what a good memory is that? So the Shaila is like this. The Ebershta says, you want to see me? Beautiful. No. Just listen. <laughs>